gentle Mary laid her child.
Evermore 
people say. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Matthew. If you're not ready for Christmas now, I don't know what to do for it. Well, I'm Cody Sandall. I'm the pastor here at the First Presbyterian Church of Littleton. Thank you for choosing to worship with us on this Christmas Eve. And uh, uh, if you are okay letting us know you're here, we have little green booklets on the inner aisles to let us know you're here, we would love to know that. There's also little blue prayer request cards in the pew racks in front of you. If there's some way we can be praying with you or for you during this Christmas season, you can fill out one of those, drop it off in the offering plate on your way out, and our staff will uh, walk with you in prayer. We'd be honored to walk with you in prayer. Uh, if you don't already know, our normal Sunday morning schedule is um, 10 o'clock um, in the morning. On Sunday mornings is when our worship service is. We have adult and children's Sunday school at nine o'clock and the kids for 10 o'clock we have a children's sermon and we also have an activity table in the back with legos uh, where they can participate in the worship service and uh, be entertained as well so that's our normal sunday morning uh, and now will you stand for hymn 145. <laughs>
even though the world seems dark. The light of hope shines brightly. Even though conflict surrounds us. The light of peace shines brightly. Even though we sometimes feel defeated. The light of joy shines brightly. But the light of love shines brightest of all. For Jesus Christ is born. Please stand if you are able to honor the reading of the gospel. <clears throat> the reading is from the gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. It tells the story of the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Hear now the word of the Lord. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria. <clears throat> and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, <clears throat> because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes 
lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. This is the word of the Lord. So thanks be to God. Thank you, Mary and Matthew. Well, throughout this Advent season, we have been noticing the ways that God can be found in the smallest box under the tree, not the big, flashy box. We talked about how God is present on the smallest days, not just in the big events. We talked about how God uses our smallest acts of faithfulness, not just headline-grabbing heroic acts. 
We talked about how God works through the smallest everyday people, those who are overlooked by others. This Christmas Eve, we're going to talk about how God changed the world by coming as a small baby. Near the beginning of my pastoral career, I was able to go to the Holy Land to visit uh, the place of Jesus' birth. And of course, they you know, built a giant church on top of it because that's what people do. And, but that church was not there at the time. <clears throat> but even inside this giant church that had been built on top of where Jesus was born, even then, his birthplace was not on the ground level. You actually had to go down into a small cave to visit his birthplace. Jesus was not born in a grand temple or a palace or a castle or a cathedral. He was born in a cave that was being used for the animals. He was in a leftover spot, not a place of honor. As a side note, I've always wondered how that conversation must have gone because when Mary and Joseph were trying to find a place to sleep, this was probably not like a Marriott, right? This is probably like a second cousin. This is probably a relative of some kind, and they come. And so, like, imagine, like, if your second cousin came over to your house on Christmas Eve, like, you may have met them a couple of times, not super close, but they've driven across the country to your house in their beat-up 1974 El Camino, and, and she's pregnant. And I don't just mean, like, pregnant. I mean, like, pregnant, right? We heard great with child. So like this baby's coming any day now, any moment. And then imagine you telling her, oh yeah, you know what? So glad you came. You can stay with us, but we got a lot of people here. So um, we have a spot for you. I know you're pregnant, so we're going to make a spot for you. The best we've got is in the corner of our basement in between the kitty litter boxes. (laughs) How would that conversation go, right? But I digress. The birth of Jesus was a small moment, to everyone outside of it. Hardly anyone noticed. But that small event eventually became the most consequential turning point in all of history. But it started very small in a cave with a little baby. We already heard that story, but now let's hear how the prophet Isaiah saw it coming hundreds of years ahead of time. Isaiah chapter 9. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with the joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor you have broken, as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the trampling warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. And the zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. This is the word of the Lord. So thanks be to God. Well, in my household, we have been getting ready for Christmas. I imagine that probably describes pretty much every household here. Um, You know, for us, we've been you know, like wrapping presents for a couple of weeks, you know, finding childcare because the kids have been out of school, you know, planning for three church worship services on Christmas Eve. And then there's the normal stuff like groceries and cooking and cleaning and laundry and some more laundry and then some more laundry. So this accumulation of tasks led my wife to remark, I wish there were more hours in the day. Anyone here ever wished for more hours in the day? That'd be nice, right? Well, I have good news for you. I have great news for you because, in fact, the day is actually getting longer. Why, we have an extra 1.7 more milliseconds per day than people did just in the early 1900s. What will you do with so much time? What will that extra 1.7 milliseconds do to your life? Although, if you rewind a couple hundred million years, the day was a lot shorter. It was probably like 21 hours in total. So you can rest assured that you are way more productive today than those early jellyfish just swimming onto the scene back then. The day is getting longer. Now the Earth's rotation may only be slowing down by milliseconds per century, but that adds up 
over time. It's kind of like a dancer or an ice skater spinning around. If you've ever seen that or if you ever watched the Olympics, you know, the, the skaters, you know, if they're going like this, it's kind of slow, but then if you bring your arms in, you spin a lot faster, and now I'm busy. Woo. Whoa. <laughs> so whenever you move your arms, you change how fast you're spinning. Just that little motion of where your arms are, where your body center of mass is, changes your rate of rotation. And the, and the moon is basically doing that to the earth. It's sloshing around the oceans, moving the arms in and out to lengthen the, uh, the, 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 the length of the day, like, a, like an earth-sized ice skater. So little things, even just the little things like the moon going around the earth, add up over time if you're consistent. Or think about water. You can trap water in your hand, right? But if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, you can see what water can do over time to carve something like that. Or here's an example for the math geeks among us. Do we any any? Got one one or two? Okay. We at the one o'clock there were there were zero. So we got like two and a half here. So we're gonna we're gonna say that's pretty good. So you're my people. Um, and for everyone else, too bad you're still getting this example. So I'm gonna give you a choice. Option A. Simple choice. Option A is I'm going to give you a million dollars today. That's a pretty good choice, right? Option B, <clears throat> I offer to give you one penny today, uh, but I'll double your stash every day for a month. So one cent becomes two cents, becomes four cents, becomes eight, eight cents. OK, we got, we got enough math to go up to eight. You get the idea. So which option should you take? Well, the math geeks among us, and most people can figure out I'm leading you here, but uh, option B, it starts small and slow, one cent, two cents, four cents, eight cents, but after 10 days, you're up to $10. After 20 days, you're up to $10,000, nothing to shake a stick at, and after 30 days, you're at $10 million, all from one little penny, getting doubled every day. Little things add up over time if they are applied consistently. If you think about it, God has been making choices that might seem small at the time, but over hundreds and thousands of years, those small moments have added up to quite a bit. I mean, if, if you think about it, if anyone has like choices, it's God, right? And because like capability is not a limitation. Knowledge is not a limitation. Power is not a limitation. Just choice. So let's think about this. Well, let's think about what God's options were instead of Christmas Eve as we know it. On a scale of 1 to 100, think about how much do you think our world reflects God's will in heaven? You don't have to call out an actual number, but I wouldn't give us like a 99 or 100. You know, there's a little more gap than that, I think. Or you can think about people. Like, do people individually, how close are we to what you think God dreams for us? I think there's some gap there. Uh, and if you're feeling bold, you can think about your own distance between uh, what God dreams for you and where you are. But if you don't want to, I'm going to give you a pass on that. That's my Christmas gift to you, is you can just think about other people, not yourself on that one. Merry Christmas. Now, whatever grade you handed out to our world, there's some kind of gap, right? Maybe you think it's big, maybe you think it's small. But there's some kind of gap between who we are and what God wants us to be. And given the fact that we aren't what God wants us to be. God had some choices that God could have made. God could have chosen to judge us as unworthy and just wipe us out. But instead, we find the love of Jesus, a little baby in a manger. Given that gap between who we are and what God dreams for us, God could have chosen to like overpower us and force us to be good little robots instead of messy little people. Instead of overpowering us, though, God chose to lie down as a baby in a manger sitting between a couple of kitty litter boxes in a backwater town. Instead of force, we were given the love of Jesus. Instead of judgment, God chose love. Instead of force, God chose love. Instead of giving up on us, God chose love. That small choice a couple thousand years ago led all the way to you sitting here today. And that little choice is, some, is a little choice that we can make too. Because every little time we choose love over judgment, we change the world a little bit. Every little time we choose love over power, we change the world a little bit. Every little time we choose love over fear, we change the world a little bit. 
Every little time we choose love over hatred, we change the world a little bit. Every little time we choose love over self-interest, we change the world a little bit. And those little things, they add up over time. More directly, those little choices change us and change the people around us much faster than the moon changes the length of Earth's days. Love changes people around us much faster than water carved the Grand Canyon. Love changes people around us more like the skater. All you have to do is a little motion. Love changes people pretty quickly. Sisters and brothers, this may be the most wonderful time of the year, but I know for some of us, this hasn't been the most wonderful year. It's been tough. Maybe it's been a little weird. Time of confusion, time of anger, time of doubt, time of division, time of being exhausted. Can I get an amen on exhausted? <laughs> it's okay to admit that. But we can still choose love the next time we get the chance. The more we choose the love that reflects this baby in a manger, the more opportunities we give for things to spin a different way. If you want to spin differently, if you want yourself, your own life, to spin differently, choose love next time. If you want your family to spin differently, choose love next time. If you want your city to spin differently, choose love sometime. If you want your state, your country, your world to spin differently, choose love next time. It may feel like you're just doing something really small, but those small things add up over time when they're consistent. 2,000 years ago, God didn't choose the judgment of lightning bolt. God didn't choose the flaming sword of anger. 2,000 years ago, God chose the love of a baby in a manger in the leftover spot in a forgotten town. That little choice added up all the way to you sitting here today. Little things add up. So what little choice will you make that can honor the love of that baby in the manger? Merry Christmas. Join me in singing hymn 123, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear, verses 1 and 2.
it is now time for our Christmas communion, and all are invited to the Lord's Supper to receive God's gifts to us of bread and cup. Where love is offered, where love is accepted, and where love becomes part of each and every one of us. So turning to the words of the Apostles' Creed, if you'd like, you can turn to page 35 in the front part of the hymnal. And together, we will affirm and say together what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And so we remember on this holy night when all those years ago Jesus took bread simple bread, and after giving God thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to all, saying, this is my body, given for you. Take, eat, and do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and he poured into it, saying, this is my blood that has been poured out and shed for you. And this is the sign of the new covenant that is sealed in my blood. As often as we eat this bread, as often as we drink from this cup, we remember Christ's miraculous birth. We remember his world-changing teaching. We remember his tragic death on a cross. We remember his triumphant resurrection on Easter morning. And we remember the hope we have of his return. Will you bow with me in prayer? Holy God, as we come before you and worship tonight. We remember that you told us where two or more are gathered in your name, that you are present. So we know that you are here with us. You are present in this room. You are present in so many rooms this evening as your people come to worship you. So God, as we taste this common bread, as we drink from these common cups, may they not be so common after all, but may instead they be an encounter with you face to face. In the name of your son Jesus, we pray. Amen. Very near you, in the pew rack where you're sitting, you'll find something that looks like this. That is what we are using at, at this time. It is your gift of bread and cup. And if you'll peel back that top little layer, you will find, we're talking about smallest things, <laughs> one of the smallest communion wafers. And well, let's give a minute so it's not always easy to get that peeled back. If you need to help someone, please do that. I'm waiting, I see a couple people still trying to get that peeled back, it's not always easy. So this is the body of Christ given for us. You can open the second lid now. blood of Christ, shed for you and for the forgiveness of sins.
Let our prayer continue. Let us pray together on this holiest of nights. Almighty God, Emmanuel, God with us. While we gather this night in warm friendship, glowing lights, and beautiful surroundings and words of love, we pray for those who are still out in the cold, literally and figuratively. May the light of Bethlehem's greatest child touch every dark place and warm every cold corner. For those who, because of chronic hatreds, terrorism, or war, are far from the promise of peace and goodwill, come, Emmanuel, and help us further the work of reconciliation, justice, and peace, which you have so faithfully set in motion. For those this night who live in refugee camps, squat in condemned buildings or sleep in back alleys, come, Emmanuel, and aid all your lost, homeless, and displaced men, women, and children to find their true inheritance. For those who are ill at home, hospital, or care center, the diseased and abandoned, the last victims of our highways and violence, come, Emmanuel, and bring comfort, hope, and healing through those nurses, doctors, therapists, and aides who do your restorative work this night. For this earth, the environment and the forces of nature striving to heal from neglect and abuse. Come, Emmanuel, help us to be good stewards of all that you have created, earth, air, water, plants, and animals, to bring new and sustaining life to all who inhabit this celestial globe. For those people grieving who for the first time are facing Christmas without their loved one by their side, come, Emmanuel, and give to them your deep soul peace that no human voice or hand can give. For the church in every land wherever it worships and works for peace, and especially where it lives under constant threat and persecution, come, Emmanuel, and give all your people the assurance of your perpetual presence and all sufficient grace. And now, almighty God, Emmanuel, God with us, we pray for ourselves that this Christmas may not pass in vain. O Spirit of Christ, you are the very word of God who became flesh and lived among us. Give each of us the will and the wisdom to back up our prayers with appropriate actions. We pray all this in the name of Jesus the baby, Jesus the man, and Jesus the savior and light of the world, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In our reading from Isaiah, we heard that the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. If you've ever read the Gospel of John, you know that Jesus is called the light of the world. And on this Christmas Eve, whatever darkness surrounds you, whatever darkness surrounds our world, we know that Jesus, the light of the world, is here. And the darkness could not would not, will not overcome him. So tonight, as we sing Silent Night, we will uh, dim the lights a little bit, and Pastor Carol and I will bring the light out to you. And uh, a little pro tip, we will, whoever has the lit candle, keep it vertical so you don't wax yourself. <laughs> And then, so if I have my, we'll demonstrate. How about that? So, you want yours lit, you tilt it. There you go. Just so. Mm -hmm. stand.
You may be seated for a moment. Every week as part of our worship services, we have a time of offering, and this church prioritizes and invests in relationships. We believe that the gospel moves through relationships. Uh, some of those relationships are in this church. Some of those relationships are as we serve throughout the city. Some of them are around the world. Some of you know that I uh, built a friendship through our partnership with Zimbabwe, with Kura Aone Mutimwi, the pastor in Zimbabwe who asked for your prayers for perseverance during this time. There's just an example of how your offerings fuel the work of Jesus Christ in this church, in this city, and around the world. The offering will be on the offering plates as you leave, but we're not going to pass the offering plates. Uh, you can also give online at any time, fbcl.org slash give. Thank you for choosing to invest in what Jesus is doing in us and through us. And now will you stand for our hymn? <laughs> Sisters and brothers, small things add up over time. What started as a choice of love for the little baby in the manger added up to what brought you here tonight. What little choice of love can you make to honor God's choice of love? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, go in peace and Merry Christmas. Merry we, do, Christmas. we do have a bin on your way out. If you will please bring these with you. Um. 